Hello, hello there and welcome back to War Thunder to a ship review. Yes, who would have thought that this is still a thing on this very YouTube channel? A look at a ship. And uh, today's star is the gorgeous looking Z25, Type Zerstörer 1936A. This is a full German premium destroyer, battle rating 4.3 tier 3 and you can get this in the ongoing battle pass season 2 as a level 38 reward and the skin that is featured the deforming camouflage is a level 41 reward the question is is this just a fancy looking hangar decoration or port decoration rather on the road to the promised centurion mark 5 slash 1 or is the ship actually worth taking out now in this review there are a few changes, but in its core, I will have an in-depth look at the ship itself, a in-depth statistical comparison with the help of some Excel spreadsheet numbers to the other 4.3 premium destroyers of other nations and also the Z20. And obviously I have to replace the five minute guide by the always ever awesome Drakini fell. Um, and I have to replace this with a link in the description down below to a rather lengthy one hour video about the interwar development of destroyers where there is some light shed on this so-called narvik class and um, let's talk about the ship by itself what makes it so special well first of all we have cruiser grade firepower and bringing that to a destroyer fight how can it not be good also it has a lot of aa but we have to always put this into perspective and I have to replace the five minute guide, not just by a, um, you know, simple link, but also by a section about why this is a deliberate scam by Gaijin. And if you think that I'm just negative here and I just want to rant, I have some comparison for you. And Gaijin deliberately changed core game mechanics in the destroyer fight to specifically benefit this ship and i think without further ado let's go into review to get the numbers to then further well underline this statement as usual i want to begin with the armor and as you can see the ship has no hull armor only gun shields for the 20 37 millimeters and also the big 150 millimeter guns the strongest armor is here for the front plate of the twin 150mm gun turret with 30mm but even that can easily knocked out by 20, 37 and 40mm AP. The rear turrets are significantly weaker with only 10mm and as you can see the ship is rather long and uh, has a rather high freeboard. It is equipped with only 4 of those guns so you when the front turret is knocked out have to give full broadside and the ship gets easily hit and it has no belt armor so eventually it will succumb to basically everything other destroyers patrol boats planes with gunfire it all has happened to me so there is one thing about the firing angles of the rear turrets while they are pretty good the lower rear turret is actually incapable of bringing effective fire all the way to where it could turn because of this blast shield here um, shielding the lower turret's crew from the blast effects of the uh, super firing turret um, when the gun barrel is below this despite having room to elevate it doesn't this has been reported but not changed yet and that is incredibly annoying as you then have to give even more broadside um, when it comes to head-on engagements, while the ship has no protection, look at this frontal array of uh, anti-aircraft guns. We have two twin 37mm and four twin 20s, so four 37s and eight 20mm where you can switch to if um, the front turret is knocked out or while you wait for the rather lengthy reload. When we go to the x-ray, we can see that there is a massive fuel tank covering the side of the ship and that absorbs quite a few of shrapnels, however you are on fire all the time when you get shot. The ammo racks are below, just below the waterline, but there is no ammo, no covering to protect them from plunging fire or from shells that just have to go a very short way through the water and then still ignite the ammo. 
So for that mana we also have the Redirex just below the turrets and they also can blow up. Not just costing you the Redirex but a lot of crew and also you're on fire, damaged, etc. We have the Torpedoes and even more arrays of 20s and 30s, uh, 37s. So there is quite a lot of AA going on and a lot of main battery firepower. So I think that covers the ship itself. Let's have a comparison with some statistics, shall we? Now let's have a look at the business end a bit more closely. The Z25's four 150mm guns are the lowest, the joint lowest amount of guns, however by quite a bit also the largest caliber. You have 120 rounds of ammunition per gun, which is the same amount of ammunition per gun as the Z20, which on a regular basis can run out of uh, ammunition in a prolonged gunfight, but it's not that much of a problem for the Z25 as it lasts longer because it has a much longer reload of 7.5 seconds. That is just short of 3 times what the USS Cowell, a Fletcher class destroyer, can pump out with its amazing 5 inch 38s and still more than twice as much as the Z Z20 which shares the battle rating uh, in the tech tree of the, as a premium ship. And so the DPM is really disastrous of only 32 rounds per minute. That is even less than the awful Ciniere and the Stroini. However, it is, you know, less than a third of effective shells per minute than the user's coal. Just absolutely amazing how big the difference can be. And that has to be then remembered when we then look at some other statistics down the line. The turretation speed isn't that awful as again the Storoini or the Kalgalsta, but again just short of being only a third of again what the user's Cowell has in terms of gun handling. The gun depression with minus 10 degrees is um, okay, the gun elevation is with 30 degrees while being the lower value in this comparison not really a big problem since you know the USS Cowell and some other destroyers have dual purpose guns so they need the gun elevation whereas here we have dedicated anti-ship guns. Therefore also the elevation speed of 8 degrees per second isn't that much of a hindrance. Let's have a quick look at what the mobile sea mine dispensers actually drop into the ocean. In the case of the Z25 we're looking at 8 533mm G7A torpedoes. The statistics here are with the torpedo mod and the statistics still get dwarfed by the almighty Japanese Type 93 Model 3 torpedo, but which torpedo isn't. Other from this I think they are pretty capable torpedoes because they have the second longest range of 14 kilometers, so they actually reach quite a bit when it comes to the actual combat distance in War Thunder. However, they do this rather slowly with only 56 kilometers per hour, but I think that uh, this speed is shared with also the Soviet and the British torpedoes in this comparison. The warhead on the other hand, while being closer to only a third of what the almighty uh, long lance derivative uh, features, the 358 kilograms of TNT warhead still bypasses with ease even the torpedo protection of heavy cruisers and also battleships. It outright cripples them or one-shots them with only one torpedo, which is rather healthy if you compare this to the um, American destroyer torpedoes. Now, that were the torpedoes. Let's talk about some other statistics, because the displacement with 3543 tons is the largest, the second one being the Z20, another German destroyer. The top speed is rather high with 71, the fastest in this comparison. And your crew is also the highest with 336 people on board. That gives this ship a rather high survivability for a destroyer that has no armor because it can soak up quite a little bit of damage before an Amorak is hit or you know you're just out of crew. And that puts this destroyer in a bit of an awkward placement. But Let's talk about what we fire with our business end at the enemy. 
Let's talk about the ammunition. Let's start with the normal HE, the 15 cm Sprenggranate L4,5 Kopfzünder mit Haube. So this is a 45.5 kg heavy warhead traveling with a mass velocity of 835 meters per second, bringing a hefty 3.91 kg bursting charge to the target. Now the muscle velocity isn't as impressive um, as you know other ships like the Chiniere or the IGN Kyoshimo, but it doesn't lose speed that much that rapidly because it has a capping for air resistance reduction and also it has an overall greater mass compared to other shells again thanks to the caliber. So you can hit targets at range much more frequently and you have a penetration power that is quite impressive of 37 millimeters. Now, this AG shell is where the controversy starts because this shell, while being the strongest, has to make up for over three times the DPM disadvantage compared to the user's Cobalt or twice as much to the Z20 Kalgalster, where you know the TNT output is then more comparable or equal. And I think that this is where Gaishin then said to themselves, well, this ship doesn't really look all that impressive. I mean, uh, the shell types, while being the heaviest, isn't that far behind the user's Kowal with its 3.2 kilograms or the Steroini with its 3.6 kilograms TNT per shells, respectively. And so you can see that Gaishin wanted to really fiddle around with some mechanics. Usually, I have to say that I played the Cowell quite excessively before the changes happened, you know, as I said, a week before the Battle Pass 2 hit. And HE was king in a destroyer fight. You could destroy a single compartment uh, with hitting it with a USS Cowell 5-inch 38 HE shell uh, with, with a single shell. And so spewing out over 100 shells per minute, that really destroyed a lot of other ships. Also the Kowal has the advantage of having armor. To bypass it, HE had to be nerfed and the emphasis of destruction had to be laid on another shell type. And that is the second shell type, the 15 cm Sprenggranate L4,4 mit Bodenzünder mit Haube. So while Gaijin classifies this as a semi-armor piercing ballistic cap shell, it is according to the official German name a HE shell with a base use. Either way, we're looking here at business. We're looking here at 960 meters per second mass velocity. We're looking at 3.32 kilograms of bursting charge for a shell that can punch through 141 millimeters at a thousand meters or at 10 kilometers still 79 millimeters of armor. And if we now look into comparison, it all starts to make sense. Because this shell, in general, does the most damage. It's not just a cruiser killer, but also a destroyer killer. And it really, really hurts the previous kings of the seas, the US distress, because they also always have the armor to activate the fuse of those uh, SEP shells. Now, this is where we're talking business. While the penetration on the Chiniere is still better, its bursting charge is roughly a third. While the Storoini also has uh, more penetration, its bursting charge is roughly two thirds and you know the DPM is also not that great of that ship to begin with. But you know, those two ships now got also a bit more value out of this. Where we really talk now business is the comparison to the USS Kowal because in order to compete with the penetration, the Kowal has to choose the SEP shell that has only 970, 907 grams of TNT. So that's a third of the TNT. Huh? And all of a sudden, it makes sense. We have a higher muscle velocity, we have more penetration, and we have th more than three times the bursting charge. So when we now emphasize the value on a SAP shell or uh, on, a, on a base use shell, that is the main damage dealer all out of a sudden. And that now reduces the DPM output of the Cowell to less than a third. Then you have equal DPM of big guns. And big guns just overall are in that sense 
at range, just blessed with a better hit ratio. The 5 inch 38s of the Cowell are dethroned by a massive amount. And this is where the ship, the Z25 with the HE, is really disappointing. But with the SAP, it's it's just bringing an absolute cruiser killer to the battlefield. It's bringing an absolute uh, US destroyer killer shell to the battlefield. And it can be really efficient right at the start of the match. At range. You have to keep your range. You have to avoid close quarters combat. And then the ship is good. Where you also can dodge enemy fire and can soak it up. And that is just too perfect for a coincidence in my opinion when you look at the changes that happened so yeah in the future when the focus goes probably back to he in order to unscrew all the other destroyers with their he stock grind this ship will fall back quite significantly but then it still has this whopping alpha strike in the he shell but as of now this shell is the absolute king of the waves of War Thunder when it comes to a destroyer fight. And I've killed plenty of cruisers with it as well. The third shell type would be the 15cm Sprenggranate L4,5 mit Zeitzünder. So that is with a time fuse equipped HE shell, therefore the muscle velocity and the bursting charge being equal to the HE shell. And I would highly recommend to not use it because of your limited ammunition capacity, your low DPM and your lackluster um, gun handling. It just isn't worth it. And also I think that you have enough 37s and 20s to protect you. And if a plane just hops over an island where your uh, dedicated anti-aircraft guns can't shoot them down, your main guns will have difficulty as well. So that has been the review part. Now let's come to the final verdict, my personal opinion, if I would recommend the ship or not. And there are basically two sides towards the ship. The first one is the positive sides. I absolutely not just love the look and the skin of the ship, but also the performance. I love that I am able to engage enemies at long range with a very high hit probability, where I have this insane muscle velocity, where I have the absolute alpha strike performance versus other destroyers, but also cruisers. If I'm not engaged, I can really threaten them. And if they are playing uh, not to their strength, if they don't focus me, I will kill them. And that makes me very much a viable um, help for my team, you know. And I think that it fits very well in the German 4.3 lineup. If you already have the Z20 Karl Galster, you, you also now have a different performing ship, you know. Bigger guns in exchange for uh, DPM, which is fine. Then we also have the fact that this is not really too much power creep as on paper. The lack of DPM, you know, is there to be compensated for the alpha strike. It just plays differently. Other destroyers still can easily kill the ship. Then we, we don't also have uh, too much feature creep because we already have cruiser grade firepower in the tech tree for quite some while with the type 1936A MOB Z32. Yes, it has a little bit of higher battle rating, so it might be a little bit of power creep, but not too much. And um, also as a premium, you know, it has the joint highest silver line modifier as we'll see in the post battle results for this specific battle where there are no boosters 750 percent silver line income with the premium account that i have will make you really feel that every kill is worth it that every capture point really makes a huge profit and it is therefore much more rewarding than let's say the premium cruisers because Specifically speaking, they get overall less kills and less action per match. And, you know, they have to deal with battleships. The worst that I can face is a cruiser. And that I am able at long range to engage and threaten cruisers with this fantastic base use HE shell is marvelous. It's deeply satisfying. There is no doubt about this. And so you might think that I'm totally sold towards the ship. And at the moment, 
yeah, it's performing really well. Also, the return fire, I kind of can soak it up. Much more than I would be expecting if I, you know, would have played this like a month ago. And this is where then we come to the negative parts that specifically are there for the ship. It's not so much its current performance, but how this performance was bought, quite literally. Because there was a nerf to HE shells and an increase to the hit points to every single um, compartment of destroyers. And that means that stock HE shell with a nose fuse is significantly less effective. Players are still stuck in this old meta. Players don't have access to SAP or um, base use HE shells. For example, the Japanese destroyers don't have access to them at all. Stock players have no idea. Players that then never try out SAP or, or base use because they are still used to this uh, HE meta. You know, people are playing this incorrectly. So you profit of this change where there was no announcement made in a, in a change log whatsoever. So it was a stealth nerf. Meanwhile, the effectiveness of SAP has been significantly increased as far as I can tell. This is where this juicy alpha strike comes from, where I deal critical damage, where the lack of DPM gets compensated quite well for the alpha strike. And especially when you get a, long, a lot of long range maps, this destroyer is just superior. To buy this performance, via nerfing all other ships is awful. It just shows the pure greediness of Gaijin, this short-sighted business model. This is why I cannot trust this company at all. And also, let's face it, at some point this ship will get nerfed directly or indirectly. And I'm not talking about the usual power creep and feature creep, where then other nations get, you know, similar performing ships or this ship will get uh, increased in battle rating. I'm talking about while the premium status will never be revoked on the ship as far as I can see because this so far has never happened, although with Gaiju never say never, the fact is we will see at some point with an economy update the nerf of the civil line modifier and also we will a reversion back to the HE meta, where then this ship still is capable, but then all of a sudden it dies much quicker. And look at this post battle results. All the epic awards, the 135,000 silver lines with uh, only a premium account, no boosters, and all the battle tasks, the uh, RP income, winning the match, that is really satisfying at the moment. But at some point this will be reverted. And if it stays this way, don't think that this is all too healthy because this ship will get spammed out then even more. Final verdict, at the moment it is absolutely worth it if you like Destroyer gameplay in the first place, but I don't think it's feature proof. And that's it for me today, so thanks for watching, thanks for listening, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a like if you did, subscribe if you want to see more, and we'll see each other in the skies, on the battlefields and on the waves of War Thunder.